Hello everybody. What I'd like to do now is present a brief lecture on the frameworks of prevention science. I plan on focusing today on the Coe et al. article with the idea that in class we will compare and contrast what we learned from Coe with the efforts of the Biglin et al. Standards of Knowledge Task Force, which was convened approximately uh, 20 plus years later. So I'll go over some definitions of prevention science as it was first proposed by the Coe et al. work group, their observations regarding risk and protective factors, the principles of prevention science as they first saw them back in the 1990s, and the future, ident future directions they identified for the field. So the purpose of COE et al. in 1993 was to begin a dialogue concerning the parameters and the frameworks for this new interdisciplinary field they were calling prevention science. Now COE and colleagues were specifically interested in preventing mental health problems in adults, um, but what they were trying to put forward was a framework for prevention science that could be applied to a variety of um, human outcomes. In this document, they provide a description and a working definition for us to consider. They offer general principles, which will outline their conceptual framework and lead to their mention of future directions. Across these slides, I've tried to use quotations when I took words directly from the text. Um, I've paraphrased in other places, but please refer to the original article for how they detail each of their impressions. So let's talk about some definitions. First of all, they define prevention science as with having the goal of preventing or moderating major human dysfunction, stating that prevention efforts occur before illness is fully manifested. So in that way, prevention research is focused primarily on the systematic study of the precursors of dysfunction and also the precursors of health or opt optimal functioning. When considering precursors, Coe et al. also define what risk factors and protective factors are. These are the variables that are associated with a greater or lesser probability of later outcomes. These are the precursors. So risk factors are variables associated with a high probability of onset of an adverse outcome. Instead of onset, they could be defined as a higher probability of greater severity of that outcome or longer duration of that adverse outcome. So risk factors are variables that emerge prior to the onset of the full disorder, but which contribute to increasing the probability that the disorder will occur or be more severe in some way. Protective factors are the conditions or variables that improve people's resistance to these risk factors and thus limit the probability or decrease the probability of significantly adverse outcomes. Now the authors are very careful to let us know that risk factors and protective factors likely are not simple but involve very complex interactions amongst several domains of study genetic, biomedical, psychosocial, environmental. So this is the beginning of a very complex multidisciplinary science. Because of the importance of these precursors, Coe et al. also go into several main points regarding their observations about risk and protective factors, and I'd like for us to discuss each of these very briefly. The first one, risk factors have complex relations to clinical disorders. Well, what they mean by this is that empirical research has suggested that specific disorders are often associated with several risk factors. It is very rare that you have a one-to-one -one relationship, just one risk factor leads to one adverse outcome. You often have several risk factors um, convening onto a specific disorder. For example, in the health field, heart disease has several risk factors, poor diet, lack of exercise, genetic risk, all of those things can confer risk for heart disease. The interaction of those things could confer greater risk. In addition to disorders having several associated risk factors, we also have evidence that each risk factor is likely associated with several different disorders. And this is where in prevention science, you often have prevention strategies that are focused on what we would call 
general or generic risk factors because of their potential to derail several different trajectories of risk. But we'll talk about that in a moment. And uh, to Coe et al, it's important to emphasize that a person's overall risk often results from the interactions between the person's characteristics and the context within which they reside. So it's never thinking about an individual in the vacuum. It's always from an ecological framework. Second observation about risks and protective factors is that the salience or the impact of risk factors may fluctuate developmentally. So sometimes a risk is most relevant in a particular developmental period and sometimes that risk will be relevant across developmental periods. Understanding the timing of when a disorder has an onset and the timing of when risk factors emerge and, and can be observed will um, really help us inform prevention practices because we need to make sure that we are targeting the developmentally appropriate risk factor at the developmentally appropriate time. So for example, if we discover that bullying in middle school actually has precursors that emerge in early childhood, you'd want your prevention program to focus on the early childhood period. The third observation is that exposure to many risk factors has cumulative effects on the individual. Now, this is going to play out differently with different risk factors and different outcomes, but in general, think of it this way, that risk is always probabilistic. It's never a deterministic if A then B, but risk factors increase or decrease the probability that something's going to occur. When multiple risk factors are involved, their interactions could lead to an additive effect or it could lead to an exponential effect such that certain multiple risk factors um, become greater than the sum of their parts. This could also be um, relevant when it comes to differences in the frequency of risk factors, the duration, how long they last, or how potent or disabling those risk factors are. Another observation is that different disorders share fundamental risk factors in common. I mentioned this briefly before. We refer to these as generic risk factors. These are the things that can conspire to lead to several kinds of disorders, and it can become a very cost-effective strategy to focus on these generic risk factors as you get more bang for your buck, so to speak, more impact if you can change these generic risk factors early. So examples could be high conflict in a family or poor peer relationships. Both of those things have been demonstrated empirically to be associated with several diverse outcomes. If you intervene on those early in life, maybe you can make uh, changes in many, many different ways. Lastly, on the observations on risk and prote protective factors, it's important to keep in mind that not only do we want to think about risk factors, but by promoting protective factors, you can reduce the probability of dysfunction. Now these protective factors, these buffers against risk, can be intrapersonal within the person or embedded within the environmental context, such as having really great responsive parents, or could be an interaction of the two. In fact, as we'll talk more throughout the course, protective factors can work in at least four ways. They may decrease the dysfunction directly. They may interact with risk factors to buffer their effects. They could disrupt how the risk factors lead to dysfunction. And this is called interrupting the mediational or the causal chain. Or they could prevent the onset of a risk factor. So the dynamics of how protective factors work can be quite complex, but in general, we want to keep in mind that in prevention science, we want to think about risk factors and protective factors as we try to impact um, the, the outcomes of human development. Now let's turn our attention to the main principles that Coey and colleagues outlined in the early 90s. The first is that prevention trials should address fundamental causal processes. Early on, the theorists in prevention science identified that research and theory need to work together to move the field forward. And the best way to do this is to have clearly articulated 
theories about the developmental processes that lead to adverse outcomes. If you have a solid theory about the precursors and their associations with outcome, then you can design a developmentally smart prevention strategy, which when you implement it, the results of it could inform what you know about the etiology or the under underlying causes of a disorder. So in this way, prevention trials that are theoretically and developmentally rooted have the potential to maintain a really good back and forth between theory and practice. Second principle is that risk factors should be addressed before they stabilize as predictors of dysfunction. This is that idea that timing of your prevention strategies is absolutely essential. And we'll talk about this throughout the class. It's important to remember, in general, later onset of most disorders, particularly in mental health, is associated with an increased severity of illness. So in most cases, the earlier we can intervene, the um, greater our likelihood that we can promote significant change. The timing of our prevention efforts needs to be theoretically driven, and earlier is usually better. Another principle is that prevention trials target primarily those at high risk. Now this idea has become controversial and in module two, you'll have an opportunity to watch David Hawkins on what he calls the prevention paradox. Um, so I'd like you to keep this idea in mind as we move forward. This principle as they first meant it in the early 90s suggests that often it's the highest risk individuals who are the hardest to reach with a prevention program and that when you're designing one you have to be really thoughtful about how you're going to engage the high risk population in what you have to offer. So prevention trials were prioritized to target those at high risk. As you'll see later, Dr. Hawkins brings up the idea in the prevention paradox that it's also important to reach the general public, that high risk individuals are important, but so is the general population, something we'll talk about later. The fourth principle is that effective prevention requires coordinated action in each domain of functioning that's implicated in the risk model that you've developed. Risk factors are often interdependent and they need to be treated like they're going to impact each other and you're going to have much better results if your prevention efforts are comprehensive. Therefore, you can reach individuals with different combinations of risk and protective factors in an equally efficacious fashion. The fifth principle is that there are implications of developmental research for prevention science that one must consider. And Coe and I et al. suggest that the field needs prospective, in other words, looking forward, starting um, young and looking forward over time. We need prospective longitudinal studies. These allow us to observe developmental processes in real time and have many benefits above and beyond cross-sectional studies. We must adopt an interactionist perspective, that social ecological model of person by environment interaction is highly valued in developmental prevention science. They suggest that we need to consider the cultural context and make sure that our prevention strategies and the ways that we measure them are culturally sensitive and relevant. We need to think in terms of systems theory, that people don't exist in a vacuum, but rather exist perhaps within a family, which exists within a community, which is going to be impacted by the broader culture. So Bronfenbrenner um, would be an important theorist for this uh, way of conducting science. And we must work in interdisciplinary collaborations, bringing public health and developmental orientations together. So looking at things with a combination of an epidemiological lens as well as a developmental orientation were thought to be necessary for this field to move forward. In fact, I think it's one of the most interesting things about prevention science is trying to capture both the variability of the individual over time with the epidemiological environment uh, behind the person. So now that we have a set of definitions and a set of principles, let's consider the 10 future directions that Coe and colleagues propose. 
And as we go through these, please think about the standards of knowledge work group that you've been reading, the Biglin et al. article, as we'll be discussing which of these future directions appear to have come true and which have not in the 20 years since. So the first future direction that the Coe et al. work group suggests is that we need to elucidate complex dynamic developmental processes underlying adverse outcomes. They call for a strong commitment to theory development and complex modeling. Secondly, they want to emphasize the complex interrelationships amongst phenomena really trying to drive home the point that prevention science is about complex interactions at a person level, at an overtime level, at a person to environment level. Third, that science should, should make sure that it's continually informing practice and vice versa. And as I've mentioned, if you have a prevention trial that is um, founded in a strong developmental theory, what you learn from the outcome of your trial could give you information about the underlying etiology of the disorder that you're studying. So practice and research should be designed in such a way to continually inform each other. And in this way, researchers need to be able to communicate effectively with lay people who will be a part of the intervention and need to also be able to put science out in a way that is readily understood by policymakers. Fourth, in a future direction, we need to think past the symptoms of a disorder in our predictive models and think about other aspects that could be important for risk factors and protective factors so that we don't get uh, stuck in a trap of thinking that um, we are so focused on the problem. We have to think outside the problem, things that we can, um, that we have some leverage on, that we can intervene with in a way of um, decreasing the adversity of the outcome. Coey et al. suggest that we consider not just long-term big picture outcomes like decreasing rates of substance abuse, but think of more short or medium term um, outcomes. Uh, for example, decreasing how much one drinks from one week to the next. So in prevention science, you want to make sure you're choosing outcomes that are measurable, objective, and reachable in the amount of time that you have to measure them. Other future directions are that we consider protective factors as much as risk factors. This may seem like common sense to you, but it was really a big idea in the early 90s and a bit of a focus on positive psychology uh, may have influenced that movement. Another future direction is that we include both continuous and categorical variables. For too long, scientists in psychology looked at um, kind of a yes-no variable, does the person develop the disorder, when over time scientists have recognized that sometimes using a continuous metric of outcome, how severe the symptoms are, for example, or how long a, um, an episode lasts, that those continuous outcomes can be more precise and um, better markers of outcome effectiveness than um, absence or presence of a disorder particularly when that disorder is driven by a biological factor and you're really most interested in trying to improve the person's adaptation to that particular condition. Another future direction is to focus on these common early emerging risk and protective factors so that you can impact many, many more outcomes and to focus on both universal and targeted prevention efforts. Now what we mean here, universal efforts are things that you do for everyone in the general population, assuming that some will be at higher risk than others, but that you are in a sense putting out a small dose for everybody to benefit from. An example might be a public service announcement about um, the importance of exercise or diet for heart disease. You're just trying to reach the general population. Targeted prevention efforts are usually a bit more intense and are focused on specific risk groups. They are targeting certain groups that are a heightened risk for the problem. And a targeted risk prevention is going to get right to the dynamics that are increasing the risk for that subpopulation.
And lastly, the future direction for science that Coe et al. suggest is that we enhance the methodological rigor of our studies, that we pay attention to possible confounds, and that we look really carefully at how we're recruiting our participants, and that we do what we can to minimize um, some of the type 1 and type 2 errors of our studies. So with that very quick summary of a, a well-written article by Coe et al., my questions for you for discussion on Wednesday will be, what do you think we've learned in the past 20 plus years? I mean, how do the uh, guidelines from the Biglin et al. task force on standards of knowledge differ from what Coe et al. Um, suggested? Let's think about possible differences in definitions, um, in concepts, in the principles of prevention science, and in the future directions. Thank you for your attention, and the next lecture will be a very brief one on the professional skills associated with being a part of a professional task force, such as the one that created the Standards of Knowledge document that you'll be reading. Thank you.